Well, increasing that, uh, population, um, increasing collections. Um, we, in, in some property taxes and real and uh, income taxes, mm -hmm. we're only collecting 60, 65 percent at best. Mm -hmm. We have to do a better job of that. Uh, some some uh, 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 fines and fees in collection. For instance, the 36 District Court. There's over 240 million that's mm -hmm. due there. You're not going to collect all of that, but you can make a better effort. Other communities, um, other counties, do a better job. Um, and also, not just increasing city, but reducing expenses. Um, our legacy cost expenses uh, were going to be in the neighborhood of 40% this year. And by 2017, with uh, 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 pension obligation and health care, it was going to balloon to about 67%. So we have to reduce the amount in the general fund, which is really what the city has to work on. We have to reduce the amount of legacy obligations which include debt service. Mm -hmm. And that's why some of the deals and some of the debt we're trying to shed is so important mm -hmm. because as a as a, a ratio, even if we hold our income constant at a billion, if we can reduce the amount of debt we have, we've raised our income. So both positive income, revenue raises by increased collections, uh, rate of growth, perhaps, and this is up to the mayor and his development authority, tax increments, difference, TIFIA, financing, things like that, but also reducing the debt obligation that we have. You increase your relative rate of, of revenue. Future Cities, um, which was done over a long time in the mayor being, has, has certain 5, 10, 15, 30 mm -hmm. year increments of the proposal. And part of what that plan is trying to do is shrink the footprint of the city. It's 139 miles of land, 143 miles, including rivers mm -hmm. and lakes. It's a huge city. Uh, yeah. you, you, you've got Boston, Manhattan, and San Francisco can all fit within our borders. So, what Detroit Future Cities has as a proposal is to try to shrink the footprint of the city, which has real-world consequences. For instance, uh, just as an example, if there is one house on the block, but you still have to flow power systems and maintain water and sewer systems and police it, then your, your cost as a percentage of the actual burden is high to police huge swaths of city that are not densely populated. That costs a lot of money. Detroit Future City seeks to shrink the footprint, but it seeks to grow the population. And so when we say growth of population, when we say growth of the city, it's not growing the physical side of the city. That, that is going to hopefully uh, reduce in some fashion that we can manage police service, but it's growing the population and therefore market theory. Um, population creates demand, demand creates cost increase, cost increase creates value, and you grow the value of the property. So that's, that's the plan. Uh, what I'm doing is, is race neutral. I've, I've heard um, about issues of gentrification or you know, trendification or hippification. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we have 143, 139 miles of land. You've got roughly seven and a half, eight miles of it square downtown. Even if you were to hippify or gentrify downtown on your mm -hmm. basis, non-people of color, because hopefully it's not just white, hopefully it's diverse. You have Asians, uh, you would have Chaldeans, you would have the governor who wants to invite uh, uh, immigration reform, so you would have Hispanic, people of Hispanic descent. So hopefully it's not just it's not just white. In fact, in, in my hometown, Washington, D.C., you've seen a diverse group grow into the city, including uh, Ethiopians, Somalians, Eritreans, uh, Russians, and others. So this, we have to think beyond just binary in terms of what would happen. But what that does do, and people have been critical of this, is it creates a certain, and this has happened, I saw this in uh, Miami, when I moved back in 83, and 81 and 82, there were race riots, and people were saying Miami was dead as we know it. That's not true, it's thriving. It happened in Washington, D.C., where when I moved up there in 91, it was still burned out through the 7th and 9th Street corridor, going up from the 68 riots, and people were saying all the white kids are going to move over in Arlington and out into Chevy Chase, they never come into D.C. Wrong. Uh, U Street, Cardozo, Shaw, Searson Quarter, places that were high crime districts people would not go to are thriving and they are diverse and people of color and white people are moving back into the city. In a city of Detroit that's 83% African American, the, the concern that somehow you could change the demographics of that city in any period of time materially 
is probably unlikely. What you can do is increase the value to all residents, and it may start downtown, this is happening here, we're 97% leased in the CBD, Central Business District. Um, we're trying, I think there are over seven different projects going up for housing in that district. But in terms of what I've got to do in straightening out the balance sheet, my role is entirely race neutral. Um, the planning department, the cities do five things. Public safety, public works, planning and zoning, finance administration, taxes and collection, and parks and recreation. Those are the core function of any municipality, and I've talked with urban planners around this. Planning and zoning is a huge function. This city has some of the greatest opportunities. We're, we're a riverfront city that has not, in, in my opinion, uh, humble opinion, exploited the river as much as we could. San Antonio is in a desert. They've got a river war. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of opportunity to bread that out with this Jefferson Corridor going up in Gratiot, going out on Michigan, wherever, and include more diverse, and if you want affordable housing, mixed use, other developments, those are long-term projects. My goal but, in the next seven months is to balance this. Right. this uh, even if I wanted to, I'm not going to build that in the next six months, okay. next seven months. Yeah, is that yeah. me? Now, there, there's a reason for that. Um, first off, let, let me go back to some people express concerns that the, the chief reports to me. People have to understand that the charter reform that was taken up in 2012, even if you go back to the regular order, uh, Chapter 7-313, um, the police reports and uh, is supervised by the commission. Um, the commission is involved in policy. Um, they're involved in discipline, they're involved, so people have an image, we have a strong mayor system, uh, a government, but even when you go back to ordinary course, the mayor's uh, primary function with the chief of police is that he serves at the pleasure of the chief, and the mayor gets to appoint four members of the 11 member commission, but the chief reports to the city through the commission. Secondly, when I came in, the police department, and you, you all have lived through it, uh, some of the prior chiefs had engaged in inappropriate behavior. They had five chiefs, I think, in six years. Uh, some of it quite scandalous. Uh, my goal and my commitment to the chief to get him here from Cincinnati, where he had did a fairly well-recognized, excellent job, um, was to give him the authority and responsibility he needed to restructure the department as I was restructuring the city's balance sheet. And that's why he reports to me. And he's done a good job with that. Um, crime is down double digits. Um, violent crime, homicide, murders, and it's not just playing with the facts. We're using ComStat now, which is a pretty universally accepted statistical measure for police forces for the first time in the city's history. So we compare apples to apples with other cities and get real statistics. Um, we are driving response rates down. We're getting new equipment. Um, the chief is dedicated to making sure this is a state-of-the-art department within the United States of America that focuses on the number one thing that I heard when I first got here, which is crime in the city. We have to get it. I meet with him at least weekly. Um, I get daily reports, and if there's any special event, um, he will call me, he'll call me uh -huh. at night, as a matter of fact, late in the night. So we speak, we speak regularly. Um, the commission, under my order, I also suspended the authority of the commission of the police to give the chief all authority and let the rank and file know that this guy was going to restructure the department. When we talk about the steps he's taking, he has raised morale fairly significantly. In fact, I met yesterday with both, uh, maybe it was Tuesday with POA and LSA yesterday. Um, he has widely been regarded as a breath of fresh air and a straight shooter in a department that needed it. So that, that will continue through my tenure. It will not continue indefinitely. Um, as I've said before, there is an appropriate time when we will go back to the ordinary order, including the role of the commission. The rationale was to make sure that the chief had the authority to restructure the department. For instance, many of the uh, uh, supervisory roles were roles that were still hold over from Mayor Kilpatrick's days. Um, I was told by, these are officers in the department, these are lieutenants and sergeants who told me that there are certain like a better word, certain uh, uh, officers in the department mm -hmm. who were Kilpatrick appointees and should not have been appointed. And I wanted him to have the authority to restructure, not just for that odd, but to restructure the department, bring a sense of morale, mm -hmm. create amongst the rank and file a belief that the department is moving to a meritocracy where everybody, including those that are line officers, have the opportunity for a promotion without what I had been told mm -hmm. was a system where it depended more upon who you knew mm -hmm. and how you behaved.
Well, there, there, there is no lack of critics of the banks, both at a philosophical level and, and at a more substantive level. Um, I do mention the banks. I mention the banks that have been in that city, and I just said, as a matter of fact, we've got to relieve ourselves of the grievous mm -hmm. debt. So actually, I do mention the banks quite often, that the debt service and that the rankings that we have as a city is not sustainable, and that pretty soon our numbers would balloon to legacy costs, meaning, as I said today, mm -hmm. um, legacy costs for uh, debt service would be unsustainable. Mm -hmm. So I do reckon. Now, there's, there are two schools of thought. There's my school of thought that looks at the balance sheet and says, we can't pay you, we agree to pay you. And there's some people who think you should be able to take $1.5 billion and walk away from it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we're suing on the cops. Mm -hmm. We're suing to invalidate the cops. Mm -hmm. Now, I will tell you, to the people in the banking community, when I go to New York and speak to them, okay, and you read about it in the Bond Buyer, mm -hmm. Wall Street Journal, um, any of the other groups, this is anathema to them. As far as they're concerned, I'm, you know, I, know, I get it yeah. from both sides. The socialists mm -hmm. will tell me, that I'm a fascist that's trying to undermine democracy as we know it, and the bankers are telling me that I'm a communist that doesn't believe in the rule of law and people agreeing with mm -hmm. the documents they agree to. So I hear from both sides. Mm -hmm. So I do mention the banks. But what I would say about that is my view is very rational, logical. I'm trying to restructure the city's balance sheet on a basis that it can operate without destroying its ability to go to the capital markets for funding that it will need. You talk about affordable housing. You can't pay that out of cash. You have to have bond issues. You have to have financing. You have to have loan guarantees, say, from the federal government. You have to have a credit rate. In today's society, the one thing you have to be able to do when we get out of all this is to be underwritable and to be financing. So I'm trying to do a very careful balance. And the people that people may not like, mm -hmm. people may hate the fact that we live in a capitalist society and may think that you know we, we shouldn't be able to charge interest. But the reality is that is the way 50 states in a country of 310 million and thousands of municipalities and counties finance their operations, whether it's sewers, conduits, water lines, and we have to leave the city in a position and an ability where it can function with a better credit rating and with a better access to capital markets. So the growth that we talked about and the access to capital and the ability to have affordable housing is something the city can plan for and actually achieve. I think the judge felt that the deals that we had cut at arm's length um, weren't good enough. Mm -hmm. um, he is the judge and certainly it is, uh, it is helpful to have the decision maker basically tell you and your counterparty you've got to make a better deal that certainly enhanced the ability of the city to go back to those parties and pursue a yet still better deal. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I'm, uh, without getting too far, because we're still in front of the judge and we're still in front of the court, um, that has yielded a benefit for the city. I, I do and I don't. Any of that? Um, first of all, you know, Detroit has got to understand several things. You know, back in the 20s and 30s, we were the Silicon Valley of the United States. Mm -hmm. If you were an engineer, an electrician, or something like that, you came to Detroit. Um, we produced the bounty not just for America, but we basically created the free world. Because um, we put out the instruments that were necessary during World War II. But, but what I would say to that is, Detroit has to recognize you're not just in competition with Chattanooga or Birmingham. You're in competition with Mumbai. You're in competition with Malaysia. You're in competition with Dusseldorf. So and if you don't modernize, and put yourself in a position where you can attract not just residents, but attract <coughs> businesses and capital, you're going to see that capital flight. I, I met with an executive from Volkswagen, not Volkswagen, he was a German auto executive, but was talking about Volkswagen's decision to go south. And he said one of the reasons they did not want to come to Detroit, because they viewed it as a conflict environment. So they took thousands of jobs away from this city, not just Detroit, the, the surrounding metropolitan area, but they took thousands of jobs because that's their impression. In order for us to be more efficient, reduce our cost, we have to have technology. I just had a technology meeting this morning. We're seven updates down in seven <coughs> technological requirements. Our new CIO who came from uh, Kentucky, Louisville, um, will tell you we're, we are well behind where we should be. So in order for us to drive the efficiency of the city, we've got to modernize.